Chapter 8. Something stepped on a little stick. As soon as a twig cracked, my eyes snapped open and I was wide awake. I held my breath and kept as still as I could. Whatever it was that was sneaking up on me, I knew I'd woke up because it stopped moving and kept as still as it could too. Even though my head was still under my blanket, I could feel two eyes staring at me real hard. And I knew these weren't critter eyes. These eyes made the hair on the back of my neck raise up the only way human eyes can do. Without wiggling or jiggling around too much under my blanket, I got my fingers wrapped on, around my jackknife. Right when I was ready to push the covers off of me and start running or stabbing, whoever it was that had been watching jumped right on top of me. I was as trapped as a roach under a dish rag. I tried to guess the exact spot that the person's heart was at, then pulled my knife back. A voice said, if you ain't a kid called Bud from the home, I'm really sorry about jumping on you like this. It was Bugs. When I tried to talk, it felt like I had to suck all the air out of Flint. I finally got breathing right and said, doggone it, Bugs, it is me. You nearly scared me to death. He got off of me and I threw the blanket over to the side. You don't know how lucky you are. I was just about fixing to stab you in the heart. Bugs looked like he knew he'd just had a real close call. He said, I'm sorry, bud. I didn't mean to scare you, but everybody knows how you like to sleep with that knife open, so I figured I'd best grab hold of you so you wouldn't wake up slicing nobody. Shucks, even though it was Bugs who'd come real close to getting his heart poked, I was the only one who was close to getting his, I was the only one still having trouble catching my breath. I asked, how come you aren't back at the home? But before he had a chance to answer, I knew you're on the lam. Bugs said, yep, I'm going back to riding the rails. When I heard about you beating that kid up so bad that you had to take off, I figured it was time for me to get going too. I thought you might be hanging around the library, so I'd come down to see if you wanted to go with me. Where are you headed? There's always fruits to be picked out west. I heard we can make enough money to get by out there. There's supposed to be a train leaving sometime tomorrow. Did you already beat that kid up in the foster home? I said, uh-huh. We kind of had a fight. How long does it take to get out west? Bug said, depends on how many trains you got to hop. Was he really two years older than you? Uh-huh. He was 12. Is it fun to hop a train? Some of the time it is. Some of the time it's scary. We heard he was kind of big too, was he? I said, he was pretty big. I can't see how he can hop on a train. They look like they're moving pretty doggone fast, Bug said. Most times, you don't hop them when they're going fast. Most times, you try to climb on one when it's sitting in the train yard. Did the guy cry after you whooped him? Well, kind of. He looked real scared, then told his mama to keep him away, keep me away from him. They even said I was a hoodlum. Will we be sleeping on the train and everything? Sure we will. Some of the time, the train don't stop for two or three days. Man, I always try to tell people that just because someone's skinny, it don't mean they can't fight. You're a hero now, bud. Nah, I didn't really do nothing much. Well, how about the toilet? How are we going to use the toilet if the train don't stop? Bug said, you just kind of lean out of the door and go. When the train is still moving? Yeah, you get a real nice breeze. Oh man, that sounds great. Count me in, I can't wait. Bug spit a big glob of slob in his hand and said, I knew I could depend on you, bud. I spit a big glob in my hand and said, we're brothers forever, Bugs. We slapped our hands together as hard as we could and got our slobs mixed up real good, then waved them in the air so they'd dry. Now it was official. I finally had a brother. Bugs said, well, we'll go down to the mission. There's bound to be someone there that knows about where we can hop this train. Then we'll, do, then we'll be on the lamb together. We found out that we'd have to go to a city called Hooperville just outside of Flint. The only trouble was nobody knew exactly where Hooperville was. It was dark before we found out the right direction. I'd never heard of a city that was so doggone hard to find. We walked on a trail through some woods that run right up against Thread Creek. We could tell we were getting close to Hooperville because we heard somebody playing a mouth organ and the smell of food cooking was getting stronger. We kept walking in the direction that the sky was glowing with the orangish light. Then when we found when we could hear the music real clear and folks talking to each other and the sound of sticks cracking in a fire, we started cutting through the trees. That way we could peek into Hooperville first. 
We looked out from behind a big tree and saw that a big wind or even two or three big wolves huffing and puffing real hard could blow Hooperville into the next county. It was a bunch of huts and shacks thrown together out of pieces of boxes and wood and cloth. The Amos's shed would have looked like a real fancy house here. Right near our tree was the big fire that had been lighting up the sky. It looked like a hundred people were sitting around it, watching things burn or waiting for the food cooking in three big pots set up on the fire. There were two litter fires burning in Hooperville. One had a pot that was big enough to boil a whole person in it. A man was stirring things in the pot with a big stick, and when he raised the stick up, he'd pull some breeches or a shirt out and pass it over to a white man who was hanging the clothes on a line to dry it. There was a mountain of clothes on the ground next to him waiting on their turn. The other fire in Hooperville was real small. It was off to the side by itself. There were five white people sitting at this fire, two kids, a man, and a woman holding the little wrapped up baby. The baby sounded like all those new sick babies at the home. It was coughing like it was half dead little animal. Bugs whispered, shoot, this ain't no city. This is just another cardboard jungle. A what? A cardboard jungle where you can get off the train and clean up and get, get something to eat without the cops chasing you out of town. I said, well, what are we going to do? We can't just go bursting into the city and expect someone to feed us, can we? Bug said, one of us has got to talk to them. Let's flip for it. Okay. Bugs rumbled around in his pocket and found a penny. He rubbed it up against his bri britches and said, heads, I win, tails, you lose. Okay. He flipped the penny up into the air and caught it. Then he slapped it down on the back of his hand. He peeked underneath his right hand to see, and a big smile cracked his face. Shucks. Bug said, tails, you lose. Dang. So what should I say? Ask them if this is Hooperville. See if they got any extra food. I moved out from behind our tree and walked over toward the biggest fire. I waited until some folks noticed me, then said, Excuse me, is this here Hooperville? The man who was playing the mouth organ stopped, and everyone else around the fire looked up at me. One of the white men said, What is it you looking for? I said, A city called Hooperville, sir? They all laughed. The mouth organ man said, Nah, son, what you're looking for is Hooverville with a V, like in President Herbert Hoover. I said, oh, is that it, sir? The man said, this is one of them. I said, one of them, he answered. They're all over the country. This here is the Flint version, and all of them are called Hooverville. That's right, Mr. Hoover, working so hard at making sure every city has got one that it seems like it would be criminal to call them anything else. Someone said, that's the truth. I said, well, how are we going to know if we're in the right one? The mouth organ man said, are you hungry? Yes, sir. Are you tired? Yes, sir. Are you scared about what's going to happen tomorrow? I didn't want anyone to think I was a baby, so I said, not exactly scared, sir. Maybe a little bit nervous. The man smiled and said, well, son, any place where there are other folks in need of the same things that you are in is the right place to be. This is exactly the Hooverville you're looking for. I knew what the man was trying to say. This was the exact same kind of circle talking and cross talking that mama used to do. Bugs hadn't had that kind of practice. He came from behind the tree and said, I don't get it. You said there were Hoovervilles all over the place? What if we was looking for the Hooverville in Detroit or Chicago? How could we know this is the one to be in? The man said, you boys from Flint? I said, yes, sir. The man waved his mouth organ like a magic wand and pointed it all over the little cardboard city. Boys, he said, look around you. The city was bigger than I thought it was. The raggedy little huts that were in every direction you looked and there were more people sitting around than I first thought. Mostly it was men and big boys. There were a couple of women every now and then, and a kid or two. They were all the colors you could think of, black, white, and brown, but the fire made everyone look like they were different shades of orange. There were dark orange folks sitting next to medium orange folks, sitting next to light orange folks. All these people, the mouth organ man said, are just like you. They're tired, hungry, and a little bit nervous about tomorrow. This here is the right place for y'all to be, Cause we're all in the same boat and you boys are nearer to home than you'll ever get. Someone said, Amen, brother. The mouth organ man said, it don't matter if you're looking for Chicago or Detroit or Orlando or Oklahoma city. I've rode the trains to all of them. You might think, or you might hear that things are better just down the line, but they're singing the same sad song all over this country. Believe me, son, being on the road is no good. If you two boys are from Flint, this is the right Hooverville for you. 
Someone said, brother, why don't we feed these boys? That one looks like he ain't eight in two or three months. Shucks. He didn't have to point or nothing. Everyone knew who he meant. But I didn't care. The food that was bubbling up in those three big pots even sounded delicious. The mouth organ man said, you're welcome to join us, but we all pitch in here. So unless either of you is carrying one of them smoked West Virginia hands in them bags, it looks like you'll be pulling KP tonight. I said, pulling what, sir? He said, KP, kitchen police. You do the cleanup after everyone's had their fill. There's a couple of other young folks who'll show you what to do. Me and Bugs both said, yes, sir. This seemed like a real good trade. A woman handed me and Bugs each a flat, square, empty tin can. That, my lords, is your china. Please be careful not to chip it. My china had the words Jumbo A&P Sardine stamped into the bottom of it. She handed us two beat-up old soup spoons and said, Don't be shy. You two just about missed supper. You'd best hurry up. She took us over to the one of the big pots and filled up our tin plates. You're lucky, she said. It's muskrat stew, and there's plenty left over tonight. Eat as much as you can. The stew was made out of dandelion greens and a couple of potatoes and some small wild carrots and some crawdads and a couple of little chunks of meat. It tasted great. We both even got seconds. When we were done, the woman told us, You boys, leave your bags here. It's time to do the dishes now. Uh Uh-oh. Ma'am, I like to keep my suitcase with me wherever I go. I promise you, your suitcase will be safe here. I remember the Amoses had promised the same thing. I said, you'll watch it yourself, ma'am. You'll make sure no one looks inside of it. She said, son, we don't have no thieving in here. We all look out for each other. I said, thank you, ma'am, and put my suitcase down near the woman's feet. Me, Bugs, and a little white boy and a little girl loaded a whole mess of dirty tin cans and spoons and a couple of real plates and forks into a big wooden box and lugged them down to the thread creek. The little girl had been in Hooverville the longest, so she got to tell the rest of what, us what to do. She said, I don't suppose neither one of you, are new, you new boys, know how to di- do dishes the right way, do you? Me and Bugs had done tons of dishes in the home, so I said, sure we do. We used to be real good at cleaning up. Bugs said, dang girl, you act like this is the first cardboard jungle I've been in. I know how do you do dishes out here. She said, okay then, we'll split them up. You and you, she pointed at Bugs and the other kid, can do half, and me and this boy can do the others. What's your name? I said, Bud, not Buddy. She said, I'm Deza Malone. Deza handed Bugs and the other little boys some rags and some soap powder, and they started splashing the dishes in the water. Me and the girl walked a little farther up the creek and started unloading the rest of the dishes. You dry, I'll wash, she said. She handed me a rag, and just as soon as she splashed out one of the tins can in the water and gave it to me, I'd dry it and stick it in the wooden box. She said, where you say you was from? Flint, right here. So you and your friend come down here to get on that train tomorrow? Where's it going? Chicago, she said. Is that west from here? Uh Uh-huh. Then, yep, that's where we're heading. I said, where are you from? Lancaster, Pennsylvania. You going to make the train too? She said, "Uh uh-huh. My daddy is. Folks say there's work out west, so he's going to try again. So you're going to wait here for him? Uh Uh-huh. She was real fast at washing the dishes, but I noticed she got a lot slow, and I was touching her hand a lot when it came to giving them to me. She said, where's your mama and daddy? My mother died four years ago. Sorry to hear that. It's okay. She didn't suffer or nothing. So where's your daddy? I think he lives in Grand Rapids. I never met him. Sorry to hear that. Shucks. She held right onto my hand when she said that. I squirmed my hand loose and said, that's okay too. Deza said, no, it's not. And you should quit pretending that it is. Who said I'm pretending anything? I know you are. My daddy says families are the most important thing there is. That's why me and my mama are going to wait together for him to come back or write for us to come to him. I said, my mother said the same thing. The family should be there for each other all the time. She always used to tell me that no matter where I went or what I did, that she'd be there for me, even if she wasn't some, even if she wasn't somewhere where I could see her. She told me, "Shucks, there's some folks you'll have, who'll have you run in your mouth before you know what you're doing." I quit talking and acted like I was having a real hard time drying the tin can she just handed me.